$10 if you get pre-registered, uh, $15 at the door. Worship game, food's fun, um, very little sleep, because a lot of games are always, you know, that's the, the heart of it. Um, one of my favorite things I miss is when, when I was a youth minister, we'd have lock-ins, and everybody would be sleeping, I'd get, go fire up all the sound system in the church and shake them out of their sleeping bag, but they wouldn't be asleep for about 45 minutes. So, uh, but that is coming up this Saturday. If you have any questions, please see Jennifer Strickler. Men's prayer breakfast will be this Saturday, November 4th. We will be in the fellowship hall. Uh, we will have breakfast. Uh, I don't know to the extent, uh, but we will have breakfast for our lock-in uh, kids as well. And we'll be cooking to that. So we hope you'll join us for our men's prayer breakfast this Saturday. Uh, one, a couple more. Thursday, this Thursday is 4F. Uh, it'll be at 11 o'clock at, at George's on Hewitt Drive. So if you're part of the 4F group or you're looking to become part of it or have questions, please see Kay Swain and she'll inform you on that. But it's always a good time to come out to have food and fellowship there at George's. Also, uh, next Sunday will be my last Sunday before I leave on vacation. Uh, I will be gone two weeks. Now, uh, November 12th, Curtis Poteen will be uh, preaching. November 19th, I will come back for that Sunday and be behind the pulpit. And the reason I bring that up is mark your calendars because November, 9th, or November 19th, we will only have one service at 1045. We will still have Sunday school at 930, but we will only have one service at 1045, and that will be followed by our uh, church-wide uh, Thanksgiving fellowship meal. Uh, it's a covered dish meal. Bring what you want. Uh, if you have questions on what needs to be brought or what you can bring or how you can help, please ask Kay Sway. But November 19th, one service, 1045, Sunday school still happening at 930, and then we will have our Thanksgiving meal uh, after the, the service. So, as always, if you have a musical gift or talent you want to use to glorify the Lord and bless us with, you see our music ministry leader, Chris uh, Becker. And also, if on the tech side of things, if you would, would like to be a backup or like to take part in the service, we're blessed with Jared and Paige, and please see them after the service. Anything else? No? Yeah, shoeboxes, okay. You lean on. My shoeboxes, yes. Not mine, the churches. This year, we've decided to be, um, for the Samaritans, their shoeboxes, and they will go to the children overseas. I appreciate Christmas tree. And inside you will find a list of different ages and what can be put in the boxes and what cannot. And then also in there will be this. And once you fill your box, you check whether it's a boy or girl and circle which age it is. And then they're $10 each to mail them. So if you would, you can put a $10 bill on top of a check. And if you don't, would prefer not to do this and just give us money, we can take care of that too. So. And Linda Stop is the one that's in charge of these this year, and we're trying to get 50 for our church. So, right. needed by November 19th. All right, needed by November 19th. 19th, <coughs> yeah, right on time, so, Tom says. I think 50 is very doable, so mm -hmm. let's set that goal as our destination, and uh, let's not only meet it, but let's exceed it. So, any other announcements? Pastor Chris? Yes. Thanksgiving dinner, or what should we all be bringing something? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be an open um, Thanksgiving dinner. You can bring whatever you choose. If you will let me know what you bring, and then we can, some people will call and ask, and then we won't get too much of one thing and too much of another. But last year we did it that way, and it turned out really well. We had a, a good turnout, and we had a good time. So, so, so bring as you feel that. And I encourage everybody to bring at least eight dozen sausage balls. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? All right, brothers and sisters, I invite you to stand as able as we affirm our faith in proclaiming the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And on the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
and sisters. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day. As winter is blowing in here in Texas, and some are excited beyond belief about that, and others not so much. But Father, we do thank you for the wonderful and nourishing rain we have gotten, and the rain is still to come. And Lord, we pray for the safety of all those around, not just in our area, but all over Texas, where flooding has occurred. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing through our church. We thank you uh, for the ways that you have grown us. Grown us towards our destination of salvation with you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for visitors. We thank you, the Lord, uh, for, again, just the way that you continue uh, to move to our <coughs> church, our youth ministries, middle school ministries, children's ministries, adult ministries, and beyond. Father, what a blessing it is to be just a small part of what you're doing here. Lord, we ask your blessings upon Sunday fun day tonight, as they go, or this afternoon as they go bowling, Baylor. Lord, keep everyone safe. Travel mercies to and from there. And Lord, just may it be a day of fun and a day of joy and fellowship. And Lord, we pray for our locket coming up on uh, this Friday, this Saturday. Same way, Lord, keep them safe. Be with our leaders and volunteers, Lord, with uh, and just a great evening of fellowship. Lord, we lift up our world to you. We lift up all the conflicts and wars that seem to escalate day by day, especially in Russia and Ukraine and in Israel and Palestine, Lord. Father, it's hard to look out to the world and see where we are loving you as we are called to love you. And then we're loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Lord, may your peace engulf the entire earth. May we not live by our differences, but yet by the many things we have in common. And Lord, let us love as you have called us to love. Father, we lift up all those who are in need of healing. We lift Ray McGill up to you. We lift my sister Melinda Eddington up to you. We lift Shorty Burton up to you as he battles pneumonia and low iron. For those battling cancer, Lord, we lift up to you. Lord, we lift up Andy Stowe to you. We lift up John Maldonado. We lift up Joe Rizzo and so many others, Lord. Be with them all, Lord, and bring them healing. We pray for Sharon Swank, Lord, that if she is uh, injured from her fall this week, that she seeks the medical attention she needs. We lift up Peggy Pritchett and her surgery Wednesday, Lord. And Father, it has hurt us to see her hurt so much. Father, be with her. Grant her the relief she needs and bring healing through this, Lord. We pray that you may wait for this to happen sooner than later. And Lord, we lift up all those families who mourn this day. And we certainly lift up the family of Ronnie Mason, Donna Mitten's cousin, Lord, who passed away this week. Be with his wife and his children and all who knew and loved him. Grant them your peace, Lord, and comfort them in this difficult time. Father, again, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you don't only call us to love you with all we have and to love our neighbor as ourselves, but you set the example of what that should be by your endless love and mercy for grace for us, Lord, in the perfect unity we see always uh, on example in the, in the Trinity. So, Lord, draw us closer to you this day and always. Father, we thank you, we love you, we pray all this in the holy name of Christ Jesus that together we pray the prayer he taught long ago. Our Father, who art
art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to the time of life. We ask that I should please come forward. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, restorer of all that is good, restorer of all blessings. Lord, just your love is such a blessing. Father, just as you bless us, we pray your blessing upon these eyes and offerings. Bless them for your glory and your glory alone. Because in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Then the day 
days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, was full of the spirit and wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord, or did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a, a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him, for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of Israel. Our second scripture this morning comes from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 34 through verse 46. Hear now the word Lord. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the law and or all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. And it's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We pray for you. Gracious God, Lord, be here amongst us. Fill this space and everyone in it with your spirit. May the words that come from my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable by you. Draw us near to you this day, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. How many of you have ever gone to the grocery store or to Walmart for just one thing? How'd that work out? We go with a destination in mind. We know what we need. We know where it's located in the store. But as soon as we get to the doors, we begin to wander. You walk by an end cap or a display showing something, and you stop, and next thing you know, you have something else in your basket. Or you're in a hurry to go in there and get that one thing, and next thing you know, it's been 20, 30 minutes. I remember when I used to travel state to state for the family company, I would love it. One thing we always do was the faster we could get our stores and get home, the quicker we got paid. It was less time on the road, and our pay would be greater because it took less time to get it. But that didn't always work for me. I used to love traveling, and I would always take the mountain routes and things like that. And next thing you know, there's an exit sign on the highway, and it says, here is this great attraction. And next thing you know, I'm exiting off, and I'm like, when will I be here again? The only, the only one I, I did that to that I ended up turning around was Niagara Falls. And I was, I was like, my stepdad's going to kill me. It's just going to take too long. And when he called me later that afternoon, I told him, well, I almost messed up. I was on my way to Niagara Falls, but I said, oh, it's going to take too long. And he grilled me for not going. He was like, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You should have went. Uh, but my point in all that is, is we have destinations in mind. Whether it's going to the grocery store, life, traveling, whatever it may be. But sometimes we get distracted. And it's no different than being a Christian and living this life and journeying this life of faith. We have a destination that we're called to, a destination that is our goal. But oftentimes, 
We get distracted by the world, the flesh, emotions, whatever it may be. And we begin to wander. It doesn't mean that we lose sight of it. It just means that we've taken a detour. And many times it's detours that we don't need to take that lead us away from our love of God and our love of neighbor. In Deuteronomy 34, what we have is Moses climbing yet another mountain. That makes quite a few mountains now for Moses. Uh, he was always seen to be on a mountain. Moses liked hanging out on mountains, but not necessarily for the mountains but because his best friend was there, the Lord. That's where the Lord would meet Moses. And sure, God lived everywhere. But in the Hebrew Scriptures, mountains played a big role. In the Old Testament, mountains were something that God seemed to prefer. So, of course, Moses spent a lot of time mountaineering, always on the mountains. But this time, however, in Deuteronomy 34, he goes up on the mountain to take on the view of it, the view of the promised land, the destination to which God had been leading the Israelites through Moses. Like a couple of retirees on vacation, God and Moses are sitting there on the mountain taking in the breathtaking and beautiful view of the landscape before them. And God even goes on and names the tribes that will settle there. Gilead, as far as Dan. Moses, we see, he's taken in the sight. But he has nothing to say. He's overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed because that which seemed like a dream a dream destination that took 40 years to come to fruition is now right there in front of him. He can see it. You can't blame him even if the tear comes up. It was an emotional, emotional time. And then there's that line. The line that seems heartbreaking. When God tells Moses, you won't be going into that land. He was given the gift of seeing it, admiring it, but he won't set foot in it. Now, it sounds like punishment, does it not? And it very likely some of it might be. Punishment for Moses' anger issue. Maybe punishment for Moses striking the rock when he was only supposed to touch it. But you can't help but wonder if, in the end, it was more kindness than punishment. And you take a quick scan to the books of the Hebrew Bible, the following book is Joshua, the one who would leave uh, after Moses. And if you read through the book of Joshua, you see that this settling in the promised land didn't go quite as easy as everybody expected it to. It wasn't, you know, just a walk in the park. There were struggles. So maybe instead of punishment, God was giving Moses time off for good behavior. Even though he struggled, he did what God called him to do. He did the best he could leading a group of people for 40 years that did not want to be led. You remember, they wanted to go back to Pharaoh. They had food. They were slaves, but they found it better there. But Moses led. Maybe God said, rest now, Moses. You've lived a life of loving God and loving neighbor. Even when both were harder than you could ever imagine when you said yes. You have to understand Moses is presented as a preeminent prophet, a man of great power and great wisdom. But what made him so unique 
was that he knew God face to face. Or rather, maybe better yet, God knew him face to face. That's probably the most incredible part of this brief eulogy at the end of Deuteronomy that we have. All the stuff that Moses could do, all the stuff that Moses did, all those years of struggling with the Israelite people, his neighbors, and here is this epitaph that God knew him face to face. Gives me chills. When the disciples caught Jesus looking at them, I wonder if they thought of those words. As they were struggling to know who he was, as they caught a glimpse that somehow he was the Son of God, the very real presence of God walking alongside them as they tromped you know, through the countryside, did they hope that Jesus knew them face to face? What a gift to be graced by a God who knows us face to face. That was the question behind the question on this contentious day of teaching for Jesus Christ. It started with a story about a feast, and then a wedding banquet, and an invitation that, took, that some took lightly with regret. And then it was tag team time, the Pharisee and taxes, the Sadducees and the resurrection and marriage, and then this question about the commandments. The commandments, to be more specific. Matthew says the Pharisees gathered together, and then one of them came out with a question, and Matthew says it was another, another test. Well, of course it was. Everything was a test for people to Jesus, especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were trying to trip Jesus up. They were trying to reduce Jesus in the eyes of the crowds. They were trying to put Jesus, the one who claimed to be the Son of God, in his place. But I wonder if there was more to this question. Mark seemed to think so. In Mark 12, he tells the same story, but he tells it with a variation of details. But whatever is behind this question, Jesus does. Jesus did what Jesus does. He answered it for them and for us with an answer that gives us life. A life-giving answer. Whether they chose to or whether we here today choose to hear it or not. He answered the question as if it was an honest question. As if, as if the lawyer, the one who asked, really wanted to know what the greatest commandment was instead of just trying to catch Jesus in a trap. He pulls from tradition. He isn't the first one to declare these two statements. Love the Lord your God with everything you have. That comes from Deuteronomy 6.5 and has its birth actually in the book of Exodus. And then love your neighbor as yourself comes from Leviticus chapter 19 verses 18. Jesus wasn't one who was saying this for the first time. And there was a great point to that. The point was, because he wasn't the first to say it, that this was, you know, in the beginnings of the Hebrew Bible, in the Pentateuch, the first five books, they couldn't argue with him. They couldn't argue. They couldn't point fingers like they loved doing at Jesus. They couldn't call him names when he leaned into the teaching that all of them already knew. He was safe. Except safe isn't what Jesus wanted. He wanted the people to hear. He didn't want them to be safe. He wanted them to hear. He wanted them to see the commandment 
Or these commandments, if you insist, are not just simply laws to follow. Like coming to a full stop at a stop sign or not pressing on the gas and revving it through a yellow light. These weren't those kind of laws. They were much more than that. These weren't just guides to a better life. They are the essence of life itself. This isn't a pathway, brothers and sisters. These commandments are a destination. It's where we are called to be going. This isn't just some good advice for getting along in this world. This is the way to see God face to face. This is who we are supposed to be. Not just what we're supposed to do. We are the one who loves God with everything within us. And we are the one who sees our neighbors as an, uh, an opportunity to love God more by loving them into wholeness and hope. When Jesus answers this question for the lawyer, for all those present, he's taking them and he's taking all of us up on that mountaintop. And he's showing us the vista, the beautiful view of the kingdom of God. Can you see it, he asked. Can you see the promised land, the destination where we all live this commandment, this description of who and what we are and will be together? Can you see it? Or better yet, Jesus asked us all, can you see yourself there? Can you see yourself at the destination in the promised land? Can you see yourselves living that way, driven by love and not hatred in the, in the walls of division that we have placed up? Shaped by loving care for all those around us. Worshiping as though it was the most important thing we can do every day, day or night. Because worshiping is the most important thing we can do. It's an outpouring of love that defines us. Scripture tells us God is love. And if we are created in the image of God, then we too are called to be loved. It's an outpouring of love that defines us, that lifts us, and that heals us. And when we get to that point of living these commandments, all the other questions, they don't seem to matter as much. That was a little tagline Jesus throws on the end about David. Who is the son? <laughs> Uh, who do you say this Christ is? For all those that wanted to test him, he tests them back and basically says, who's in charge? Who's in charge? That's the question he asked them. That's the question God is asking us today and every day. Who is in charge? Who is in charge of your life? Is it you? Is it the flesh? Is it Dr. Phil or Oprah Winfrey? Who is in charge of your life? Is tradition and heritage in charge? You know the, that old excuse, well, this is the way we've always done it. Is it the world and the flesh that tears at us and tempts us with sin? Just like the products at the grocery store and Walmart you tempt us as we walk past. And trust me, after working for Cobra for so many years, those products are placed there for a reason. The music that is played in those stores at a certain time of day is played for a reason. They plan this stuff out. Who is in charge? These things? Or is it the indwelling Spirit of God that is moving us towards or forward into the promised land? 
of hope and love? And that's the question we must ask ourselves every day. Who is in charge? And who is leading us? And if the answer is not God, then we need to recenter and refocus. Brothers and sisters, as we draw closer to God, as we draw closer uh, to living life for God by the way God calls us to live it. As we move closer to loving God with everything we have and loving neighbor as ourselves. Guess what? We move closer to catching a glimpse. A glimpse of God. The one who knows us face to face. And what greater joy can be that than to see God face to face. Because when we see God face to face, brothers and sisters, that means we've reached our destination. Know where you're called and know who's calling you. Pray to God with the Holy Spirit to drown out. Drown out those other voices in this world. And keep moving forward to the prize. The prize that Jesus paid much too high a price for us to win. Keep moving forward, and I promise you, you will catch a glimpse of the one who created you and the one who knows you face to face. It's the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> my prayer is that the Spirit moved in you in some mighty way today. In any way. If the Lord has moved in you and you want to speak with me or want me to pray with you about something, I invite you to come up. Maybe you want to pray to the Lord by kneeling at the altar and praying on your own. You are more than welcome to do that. Not just at this time, but at any time during the service. If you want to accept Lord Jesus as your, uh, as your Savior today, let's do that. If you want to officially join our church family today, let's do that. Or maybe you've never been baptized and the Spirit's convicted you that it's time to be baptized and ushered into the kingdom of God, to the church. Or maybe you have been baptized and the Spirit is moving and you feel convicted to rededicate your life to the Lord by remembering your baptism and renewing your vows. Let's set a time to do that today. So let's say that Brothers and sisters, would you please stand as able as we sing to the glory of our loving God.
We have the destination that we're called to be marching for. This world can pull us side to side, yank us backwards. But we're not chasing this world. We're marching forward to Zion, the wonderful city of God. Brothers and sisters, you were created for this journey. Walk it fearlessly. But walk it in the spirit and with your eyes on our guide, the God who knows you face to face. Would you please receive this benediction? Go from this place, and may God keep you and bless you, and may his face shine down upon you all your days, and may you forever be marching towards Zion. You may go in peace. Amen. Amen.